still to come on the news hour tonight, avoiding medical mistakes, the secrets of an old skull, and the tale of a ship and a storm. Susan Denser of our health unit has our medical story. The unit is a partnership with the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. Are we out of hold yet? Uh, no, we're just going down to 8,000. A recent yep. performance of a play about airline disasters oh, had the audience like mesmerized. I knew we were going to do that. All right, I got it. Okay, okay nice. Trying to keep it at 180. Okay, mellow out. Yeah. <laughs> Called Charlie Victor Romeo, the play is based on actual transcripts of cockpit conversations before planes crashed. When it played at a New York theater, pilots in the audience raved about how well the production captured the human dynamics leading up to crashes. Here at this conference, the audience consisted of several thousand doctors, nurses, and other health professionals. They were watching the play for similarities between airline crashes and mistakes in healthcare. In fact, the members of the audience said the confusion, tension, and noise of the airline crash scenes reminded them all too much of this. Code two, code two. We have a uh, 54 year old white female. No paramedics are available. Chaotic scenes like this one set the stage for medical mistakes, a major problem in healthcare. A high-profile 1999 study by the Institute of Medicine estimated that between 44,000 and 98,000 people die each year from errors committed in U.S. hospitals alone. And in February of this year, the IOM released a new study calling for a health system overhaul. We are saying that the care is not satisfactory. We are saying that the care the American population gets is not the care they should get. Dr. Donald Berwick heads the Boston-based Institute for Healthcare Improvement. He's one of the experts who participated in both of those Institute of Medicine studies. We're also saying it's not a matter of the effort or the will or the skill or the dedication of the American clinical community. They're wonderful. If the doctors and nurses weren't trying as hard as they are, we'd be in a lot worse shape. What we're saying is they need help. The American physician and nurse cannot now alone, without re-sign of the system, give the care they want to give. Uh, the game is over. And that's why Berwick's Institute for Healthcare Improvement brought the cast and production of the play Charlie Victor Romeo all the way from New York to California for the organization's recent annual conference. Well, when I saw Charlie Victor Romeo, I recognized in the stress and the patterns of interaction and the, the kind of difficulties that arise in the airplane cockpit exact replicas of what happens under uh, not just intense environments, all environments in healthcare, operating rooms, emergency rooms, and they lead to the same kinds of problems that we, that we saw in the play. Perhaps few people understand that more than Dr. Jim Espinoza. He directs the emergency room at Overlook Hospital in Summit, New Jersey, one of four hospitals in the Atlantic Health System. We probably need to draw some bloods here. Espinoza and his colleagues reenact actual events in healthcare to try to learn what went wrong. We visited them at Overlook recently as they performed several reenactments related to scenes from Charlie Victor Romeo. One was inspired by this scene, based on the 1996 crash of an Aero Peru jetliner after takeoff from Lima, Peru. Let's go to basic instruments. Everything's gone to shit. Lima Tower, Aero Peru 603. The scene showed what happened when the pilot and co pilot realized that the plane's instruments were giving them skewed readings. The airline maintenance crew had taped over the instrument sensors while cleaning the plane and had forgotten to remove the tape. Okay, what would be the real speed? This one's okay, they're okay, the speed, airspeed? Yeah, but with all the power cut down, it can't be! Frustrated, the pilots argued over what to do, with each one trying to establish control. Back at Overlook, Espinoza and his colleagues discussed the lessons. The irony and the tragedy of the event, as I see it, is that had they flown the, just flown the plane, sort of basic compass and stick and, and external visual cues, they actually could have gotten through it, but they kept returning to the faulty information they were getting. Then they reenacted an event at the hospital that had raised similar issues, lack of cooperation, disputes over who was in control, confusion over technology, and failure to keep watch over the patient. The scene began when a team of emergency medical technicians, or EMTs, brought a heart attack victim to the hospital. This gentleman uh, had a syncopal episode in the streets. 
The team needed to transfer the patient from the EMT's heart monitors to the hospital's equipment. But that proved impossible since the technologies were incompatible. Does your pacer pads go to ours? It doesn't go. Can you get that wire down there? Which one? Which color? The green wire. That one there. We should be able to connect it there if it's working right. But as I said, they don't interface. Oh, you're okay, right. so it's Since the equipment was incompatible, nurse Lori Sagard asked Deborah Timpson, the EMT, to leave hers behind for a while. Do yeah. me a favor, would you just leave your pack for a I couple can't. minutes? How come? I, because I needed to go back on the truck. Oh, gee, okay. As they haggled, they suddenly noticed the patient had deteriorated. Oh, I think he might be in a third degree block here. I'm looking at my monitor. Actually, ours is like Zip. flatline. Sir? Okay, I'm getting a pulse, but it's very slow. After that near disaster came another one. Let me just put on new pads, okay? Ah! Oh, are you okay? We need help from oh, here! Okay. In the course of putting new pacer pads on the patient, emergency room technician David Samko got shot. Do you have any chest pain? Difficulty breathing? Yeah. The episode could have seriously injured or even killed okay, Samko, but fortunately did not. Here, so Later, the team sifted through the lessons. Pat Gabriel, the emergency room nurse manager, started it off. I could see how this would happen every day. And okay. my wish is that we could somehow not have spaghetti on the bed. Okay. When you look at all those wires and those IVs, it's just spaghetti. And the issue of somebody being in charge was mm -hmm. very apparent to me. Everybody knew what to do, but no one took, there was no director. As you watched it, it was a lot like the feeling of watching the CVR, the pilot and the co-pilot the nurse and medic sort of sol problem solving s sort of in parallel tracks without knowing what each other were thinking. I felt concerned for the patient and okay. for the safety of the patient and I also wondered how much of the frustration the patient felt. Joe Roebuck, a trainer for Atlantic Health Systems, summed up. What we learned, there was really nobody focusing on the whole picture. The challenge I would have for you interpersonally is for each of you is talking more in experiences like that and even sharing your doubts, sharing your confusion. With that, the group turned to a second reenactment, once again inspired by issues raised in a scene from CBR. This is United 232. We blew into number two and we've lost all hydraulics. It was based on what occurred aboard a United Airlines flight in 1989, when the crew realized that the plane's hydraulic system and flight controls had failed. Maybe we can only turn right. Uh, we can't turn left. United 232, Kelly, uh, I understand you can only make right turns. That's firm relief. At that point, a flight instructor who happened to be on board as a captain. passenger came into the cockpit to help. My name's Al Haynes. Hi, Al. Denny Fitch. How do you do, Denny? I'll tell you what, Al. We'll have a beer when all this is done. With the aid of Fitch's calm and level-headed guidance, the pilot somehow managed to get the plane to an airport runway. See, we got the tower view. It's right here. One o'clock low, Al. One o'clock low. That's right. Pull the left one back. Pull the left one back. At the end of the runway, it's just a wide open field. Left. Uh, right. uh, oh. Left. Uh, left. The plane cartwheeled as it was touching down, and 110 people were killed. But 185 on board survived, including the crew. They actually were able to save a lot of lives by having an even-tempered expert come in and from the back who actually turned out to be a captain and a trainer i think we're trying to show how the even tempered experts influence plus the resources that person can bring to bear could settle the thing down so the overlook group tried to apply similar lessons to avoid a distressing and routine occurrence the D word. You want me to say it? Okay. That's D as in diversion. That's what happens when a hospital emergency room becomes overwhelmed with too many patients. Ambulances bringing new patients to the hospital are turned away and told to go to another hospital in the area. Some critics have charged that diversions at hospitals around the country sometimes put patients' lives in peril.
The Overlook team tried to play out what usually happened in the emergency room to force a diversion. This lady has chest pain. We've been waiting here a long time. Move this one into the cast room, move the cast room out right in the hall, right outside the cast room. Dr. Smith was which line? Wait, wait, we have a suicide here. Now, Jerry, I really need to get to Mr. Nelson. What room is he in? I really have no place. I have really no place. If you could just wait a little bit, I'll do the best I can. It's like moving people around. Two seconds, Veronica. Two seconds. Let me just see if he's stay with his parents or his parents. As is typical in emergency rooms, the confusion and noise escalated. Joe has somebody with chest pain. All right. And what's another telly admission? Can you just cover me up here for a second while I make that phone call? Suddenly a call came in saying that three victims of a car accident were being brought in. Well, I just got a call on the ear radio. We're getting three patients from an MBA. Oh, my gosh. All right. Let me call Linda. Let her know what this is. No one's at lunch. I've got a uh, motor vehicle accident with three coming in. What are, what are my options? Are we going to talk about diversion here? Then, borrowing a leaf from that CVR vignette, the calming force arrived in the form of Linda Cousinick. She's Overlook's chief nursing officer and the hospital's top official in charge of operations. At some point, somebody's got to take control. Okay. Oh, good. Maybe give us one second. I called. Let us just follow right. up. I called. Let's figure out what's going on. Why don't you give me an idea? How many patients do you have? Yeah. A total of 28 signed in. Kuznick called on other departments of the hospital to help move patients more quickly out of the emergency room. Okay, now I know that we held the recovery room open for you to put send your admissions up. So is it the problem you're not getting the bed assignments or is the problem that you can't get them there? I, both. Yes. Okay. As Kuznick took control of the system, the sense of panic no. subsided no. and the diversion threat was called off. You should have a good six or seven patients out of here within a half an hour. The reenactment ended. And once again, the team discussed how to make things work better. You know, but you get to a point, when you get to this, there's a break-off point, you know, you can manage this and you, you continually expand your bag, you know, but you get to a certain break-off point where it's just, the bag breaks. It's just okay. too many pieces, too many demands, not enough hands, not enough stretchers, not enough room, not enough resources mm -hmm. to be able to handle it. Okay. Linda, when you came in the room, as the chief nursing officer, what did you experience and how did you see it? It looked very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you have a calm unit if the charge nurse is calm. Mm -hmm. And eventually, though, they become so, so overloaded that they finally do get caught up into the chaos. Right. And so you kind of have to break the cycle, and mm -hmm. that's what has, has to happen. Mm -hmm. It means that you really have to focus on what can I do to bring the tone down in the unit, to make it quieter, to start to relieve the stress that's there. Yeah, good point. And that's resources. Later, Kuznick told us that the reenactments motivated hospital staff to tackle problems and in ways that other efforts to fix mistakes did not. Previously, if we said, we'd like to work on flow, not to go and divert, or we'd like to look at, at a yeah. process improvement, you don't get anybody to come to your meetings. You know, they say, oh, geez, I'm overwhelmed. It's too busy. I worked really hard today. But they were volunteering today. They see the difference. They see the opportunity. They see solutions. And to Dr. Berwick of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, these ways of surfacing the problems in healthcare underscore a powerful truth. The message we're trying to bring now is we need to work on the culture also. It's communication, feelings, teamwork, interactions. That's where safety lies, not just installing a new computer. The Institute now plans to use both Charlie Victor Romeo and the Overlook Hospital reenactments to help spur changes at other healthcare systems nationwide. Okay, you ever have anything like this before?